if you would ever like to truly appreciate what your pastors have to do on a weekly basis, pick up the 17th chapter of John and try to figure out how to explain it to somebody. It is an interesting challenge. I ask that you would join me for a moment of silent prayer, that the words I speak might be the words that God would have you hear, that the message might be of value in your life and in my own. Let us pray. Amen. If you only read today's gospel lesson, you might think that it was spoken by a resurrected Jesus, preparing to ascend to the Father. Two verses before this passage, Jesus says that he has finished the work that the Father sent him to do. In the passage itself, Jesus says he is coming to the Father. He points out that as the Father sent him into the world, Jesus now sends the disciples into the world. He says that although the disciples are in the world, they do not belong to the world, just as Jesus himself does not belong to the world. He asks God to protect the disciples from the evil one. This sounds pretty encouraging, doesn't it? Jesus is sending the disciples into the world protected by the power of the Father. It is important to realize that this is part of a prayer being spoken before the betrayal by Jesus, before the trial and condemnation, before the torture by the Roman soldiers, before Jesus' death on the cross. Can you imagine what the apostles might have been thinking after all of that occurred? Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say that he had finished the work that the Father sent him to perform? Didn't he say that he was sending us into the world the same way the Father sent him? Surely God would protect his son from evil the way Jesus asked God to protect us when he asked me to follow him. It did not occur to me that I was volunteering to be on the receiving end of betrayal and torture and death. We know now, of course, that this is precisely what did happen to many early Christians. They did follow Jesus into a world where they were on the receiving of precisely those things, betrayal, torture, and death. So what does it mean to be sent into the world without belonging to the world? What does it mean to have been protected from the evil one if you are still subjected to death? Jesus was sent into the world to perform the work of the Father. He then sent the disciples into the world with much the same mission. If we look at Jesus' life as a model of doing the work of the Father and therefore of being sent into the world, it's clear that this required being actively involved. Jesus did not stay in the wilderness living the life of an ascetic. He did not wear clothing made of camel hair and eat wild locusts and honey like John the Baptist. He did not live a life which many people would associate with being a holy man. He walked and talked with people. He ate in their houses. He healed their illnesses, cast out their demons, fed them in their multitudes, and forgave their sins. Jesus taught about the power of the Father and God's love for all of his creation. We know that even before that last trip into Jerusalem, Jesus sent the disciples out with exactly the same sort of mission. They were told to tell of the coming of the kingdom and to heal the sick. To be sent into the world was to be charged with caring for God's people and for all of God's creation. But there was more to it than that. Being sent into the world also meant being subject to all of the things that can happen to us. It meant accepting the possibility of hunger and fear, loneliness and pain. Being sent into the world meant allowing a friend to make false accusations. 
It meant accepting even unearned torment and death on the cross. In this, Jesus was not unique. There were many martyrdoms among the early Christians, and there is still no guarantee even in this day that allowing Jesus to send us into the world will mean that our lives will be comfortable or safe, or even that anyone will recognize that those lives have served God's will. So what does it mean when Jesus says that the disciples do not belong to the world? They are clearly living in it. They continue to interact with the world and its people on a daily basis. For me, belonging to the world, not belonging to the world, means living by the Father's system rather than the world's. It begins with understanding that it is not the things of this world that give us joy. My grandparents taught me early in my life that when you expect things to make you happy, you always need just a little bit more than you have. You need a nicer car or a bigger house or a better location or a larger paycheck or a more impressive job title. No matter what you have, the amount that you need is greater still. I learned that if you are happy, you have what you need, no matter how little you have. But if you need things in order to be happy, you will always need more, no matter how much you do have. To belong to the world is to tie yourself to the cycle of need and expectation. To not belong to the world is to accept that God will see to it that you have what you need and are in the place and the situation that will make it possible for you to be the person he wants you to be. To not belong to the world is to remember that God is in charge, that he will give us lives of beauty and meaning even if they are not the lives we would have chosen for ourselves. There is no guarantee that those lives will be easy or comfortable. We cannot be sure that anyone else would look at them and consider them successful. But there is great joy in living a life of service to God and to our neighbors. This leaves only the final question. What does it mean to be protected from the evil one? I must confess that I think in terms of evil itself rather than the evil one. Because if there is someone else responsible for the evil, it lets me off the hook gives me someone else to blame for the things that I do wrong. Regardless of whether the evil is urged on us by a tempter or originates within us, we still have to choose between cooperation and resistance. Even when someone chooses to cooperate with evil, the result does not have to be evil. God can turn evil intent into a blessed result. It was evil on Judah's part to betray his master, teacher, and friend, but it was necessary in order to force Jesus' arrest. It was evil on the part of the priests to condemn Jesus, but it was necessary to force his torture and crucifixion. It was evil on the part of the Romans to kill Jesus on the cross, but it was necessary for his death and resurrection and for our salvation as well. Jesus was protected from the evil one because what was intended for evil was turned into a blessing by the Father. When Jesus asks the Father to protect the disciples from the evil one, he does not mean that their lives will be easy or comfortable. Evil things may still happen to them and to us. Our responsibility is to know that God can turn everything that happens into a blessing. And we have to choose how, we'll, how we will react to those things. When we suffer setbacks, do we react with bitterness and anger? Then and only then have we given the evil one power over our lives. Do we react with acceptance and determination? Then we have been blessed and strengthened by God. 
I do not know whether I believe that God specifically plans out every detail of what happens in my life. I only know that he gives me the strength to choose how I will react. I believe that it is my duty to accept with joy and thanksgiving all that occurs, trusting that even painful events will somehow make me stronger, that even a life I would not have chosen for myself may be of benefit to the people around me. I believe that as long as we can remember that we are God's to do with as he will and can accept the lives that he has given us, we have been truly protected from the evil one no matter what happens to us. To God who protects us from all evil, who gives us lives that we can spend in joy and in service, be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen.